To start today's proceedings, I would actually like to call on Michael West from the Metropolitan Local Land Council to give us a welcome to country. Michael. Good morning, brothers and sisters. On behalf of Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, we welcome you to this land. We'd like to say respect the land, respect each other, have a safe stay, a safe journey home to your family and loved ones and your communities and to continue the good work that you're doing. Let's work together to make this a great country and show the rest of the world. Culture is very important. What you hear is about culture. To Aboriginal people, community and culture are everything. Thank you. Today, so the minister wasn't able to join us, but he has sent through a message which I'd like to read on his behalf. Um, today's forum provides the opportunity to contribute to Australia's first national cultural policy in almost two decades. We want to better connect arts and culture to the mainstream of modern Australia. It's about joining the dots, linking arts and culture to broadband, community development, education, health, disability, Indigenous affairs, social inclusion and regional Australia. I firmly believe governments must invest in the arts and culture because investment produces great dividends. It produces a social dividend because it empowers individuals and underpins our values of freedom of expression, tolerance and inclusion. It also provides an economic dividend because all of the evidence so far suggests that a creative nation is a more productive nation. It lifts capability as well as productivity and makes us more competitive. That is why we are embarking on a 10-year vision for arts and culture. I look forward to hearing your ideas and how we can better connect arts and culture to the mainstream of modern Australia. I think the Minister's message sets out what the, our aim is also for today. It's about what does the future look like to ensure that Australia is you know, at the forefront of producing excellent art and cultural development and empowering our communities to actually achieve that. And so that, it, as we always say, that arts and culture becomes part of everyone's everyday life and they have the resources and capacity to actually achieve that. Today is fundamentally about looking at the national cultural policy, the discussion paper set up by the federal government, and about the role community arts and cultural development plays within that, and how we can move towards actually implementing the objectives and the aims of the national cultural policy discussion document. From the Australia Council perspective, the Australia Council has from its inception supported the production and the creation of art in community-based context. We're looking at outcomes of producing excellent art and we're looking at outcomes of producing great community arts and cultural development process and work and at the end of the day to actually empower communities to explore their creativity and actually be part of the national cultural fabric of this country and the vibrancy of this country. Ladies and gentlemen, I suppose the hope we have for this meeting uh, today is that the people who will go on influencing the shape of the national arts policy will leave here with a, the clearest possible understanding of the fact that the um, community arts and cultural development sector is an important part of the overall picture. If you look at the draft policy, there are lots of words which I think are relevant to this sector. Uh, the Minister's opening comments, I think, are a reminder of the relevance where he says in the third paragraph, how arts and culture can contribute to achieving Australia's goal by helping to build an inclusive society, delivering an arts education to young Australians, creating career pathways, providing avenues for expression for our citizens, driving innovation and contributing to productivity. And later in the document, you get reference to things such as the desirability of really spreading the dollar, although that's not the language used by encouraging partnerships. I must say I've found it personally inspiring to see the quality of the art which has come out of work which might have been classified as social work, where people, in my view, are being admitted to full humanity. They're being given an opportunity to lead a truly human life through access to the arts. So I guess what I'm saying is that I'm a great enthusiast for the issues that we're talking about today and we hope, I think, that the broad experience of this panel will enable those who will have the ongoing task of developing this policy to go away with a better understanding of how it needs to be written in a way which uh, acknowledges and facilitates the growth of this important area of the arts. Don Watson wrote, we made the mistake which is common in political offices. We mistook a good intention 
for doing something. Okay. And uh, having been a politician, let me say I respectfully adopt that. I think that is a huge challenge for government. So I think the conversation we're about to have is about what are the right words for policy, but also how do you actually turn that policy into something that happens? What are the arms and legs? Arts policy has to be delivered. And so we hope that part of this conversation will be about the implementation of the really marvellous ideas which are here. What can be done and does this sector have something to do with implementing the policy hopes that are set out in this draft document? Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And uh, I suppose uh, uh, our interest from FECA in the national cultural policy has been uh, from a recognition that um, culture is uh, and art is very important for, for certain communities, particularly for some cultures where they define themselves, their identity at um, symbolic levels through art. Um, it was really heartening to see that Simon Crean, uh, Minister Simon Crean, in his, um, uh, in his introduction talked about symbolism, feeling, and metaphor, which are unusual words um, in, in politics, uh, but that is exactly what um, what art is about for many communities. It's not a separate practice, something that's self-conscious, but something that defines identity and belief. Um, and so we recognize that very much in the communities that we work with. And I think uh, what was really um, great for us was that it was actually a national cultural policy, not just a uh, policy about arts, but it, it recognized the, the absolute interdependence of culture and art, so that was a really good beginning. Uh, there is a kind of watering down about discussions around cultural diversity across the board. Um, we did note that in the social inclusion policy, for example, um, culture was very marginalized. It wasn't in the main priorities of the social inclusion policy. It was um, sort of a bit of an afterthought within that document. Um, so since, that, uh, since the social inclusion policies is sort of the policy of note at the moment, um, you know, th that was of concern to us that uh, culture hasn't been taken as a key factor. And I think that was reflected um, in the document as well. I mean, when you talk about social inclusion, there is a question of inclusion into what? Um, and when you have that kind of cross-cultural space, having worked in that space myself, you're actually engaging on a much more equal level. Um, within that space as well, there's a question about who is leading that. Um, and once again, sometimes we find that a lot of cross-cultural um, projects or initiatives are not often led from within other communities. Um, I found that in my work in Europe as well, I find that to, the, to some extent that's reflected here. So one of the things that um, we talk about is where, where's the leadership located? Who's leading this project? Is there equality? Um, are we open to creating a plurality of aesthetics, a, pl a plurality of understandings about, you know, even what constitutes culture? I think the other really important point from the previous speaker is her question, who's leading? Because I think in terms of implementation, that's an issue that we might want to revisit during the day. It's one thing to express the principle again, but who's actually going to lead that process? Uh, the document acknowledges the importance of emerging technologies. Uh, I think it's fair to say that NBNCO and ourselves would suggest that Australia will take some time to actually understand the profound change that the national broadband network will bring and the opportunities that it opens up to every community, however small and however remote, right across Australia. Mm. One of the things I really wanted to do here today was uh, not so much to bring my personal perspectives, but to reflect on the uh, hundreds of contributions that we've had about digital culture. And uh, it's interesting about the idea that um, it's going to take a long time to understand how profound the changes are with new technologies. but. Um, one of the things that um, certainly has been obvious, well Australia is one of the fastest adopters of new technologies in the world um, and that's part of the reason why we, we get so engaged in, in sort of new trends and new, new um, things as they come up but, um, and, and just to, to touch base on the, the uh, cultural diversity, um, all of the people from arts, from the industries that have got involved, from the industry representative groups, uh, from the cultural institutions right across uh, regional metro and uh, the national cultural institutions that have got involved in the digital culture public sphere consultation have all reflected very strongly on um, 
Australia's cultural diversity being one of its great strengths uh, in terms of uh, how the art and culture that comes out of Australia uh, is globally relevant. Um, there's a global marketplace, if you will, for um, the, the products, the artwork, the, the outcomes. And uh, it's, a, it's a thing that's very, um, that places Australia in a, in a very strong position in this place. Um, and there's one of the things that came out very strongly was the need to create a national narrative. Because in every one of the sort of areas that we've spoken to people, whether that be games development, film and animation, media and music, digital arts, or cultural heritage, in every one of those areas, um, Australia has world-leading innovation and world-leading recognition, and yet there's not that national narrative of Australia as a hub of cultural excellence. And, um, and so, in fact, Australia is often enough portrayed internationally as, you know, uh, bikinis and beaches. So um, how do we sort of start to turn that around and really start to um, create that, that narrative of the entire sector as a, as a cohesive and, and strong area? Uh, a couple of other things I just wanted to briefly throw in. Um, the, I mean, the internet has certainly made arts uh, really quite democratised. Anyone can create, can distribute, can connect with communities. Um, and so trying to build in sort of um, uh, more flexible ways into policy of recognising, supporting, um, exporting and developing skills for art in Australia is obviously quite vital and that's come up a lot about skills development. I'm delighted that the document says government has a role to play in the development of national culture. A free market in this will always leave people with disability out. The patterns of inequality and discrimination that are shown in areas of education, employment, housing, all of those things that we know about, the persistent disadvantage within the populations of people with disability would be replicated and replicated within anything to do with arts and culture unless we bring a conscious effort to change this. And so I'm delighted that the policy opens up that conversation for us. And so I think when I look at it, there's a necessity to both name and claim a release from the trap of the therapeutic in the area of disability, a release from Disability Central, a strong claim coming from people right across the whole of the disability communities that we're not going to be shut out any longer. And I think that that will deeply enrich the nation's culture. I think it can feed into this national narrative, which is about how we can build a citizenry where people are accepted in all of their differences. I think that we've got some really key issues around leadership. As I've said, I think that our arts leads our disability policy in, in telling a new story for people. But I also think that we've got some really big issues around partnership and how that happens and whether or not partnership is truly equal or we just continue to be in the add-on status. And I think that what we can do is build on the significant strengths and capacities of this sector in Australia, which not only leads us in our thinking and our feeling about this, but demonstrates something to the wider world about how it is that we can ensure that the voices and the stories of people with disability are added to the clamour, which we must hear. So I'll leave it there for now, but um, I think that we've got some really important work to do to thicken diversity, social inclusion, our understandings of culture, access and participation, and to work on leadership, partnership and cross-linking strategies. Thank you. Uh, Lorna, I have to explain sometimes to my wife why I've taken another couple of days out of my life and gone away. And I guess when I go back to Perth, I'll say to her, well, this is what Lorna said. And I think she'll <laughs> think that's a very good reason for travelling a couple of thousand miles. The, the challenge, I think, in what you've just heard from Lorna, though, is that if you took that powerful and organised contribution and you took out the word disability and put in the word poverty, or poor, if you took out the word disability and put in the word Aboriginal or Indigenous, many of the same pleas that she's made would apply. So I really just wanted to interfere with the conversation a little bit to say that there's a universality, I think, in the points that you made. The label Indigenous needs to go out of this policy first and foremost. We've already been labelled Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. We're not Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. We're Murawari, we're Goombangi, we're Dangari, we're Yolong. We all have our own identity. 
This country was multicultural way before 1770. Yeah. So the partnerships are really important for us to move forward as a people because art and culture is about health, is about education, is about welfare, is about law, L-O-R-E. We really need to embrace this cultural policy holistically as a nation. So I suppose what I'm asking for from this forum is support for a preamble for the per First Nations people of this country. Well, Lily, um, as a member of the panel on constitutional recognition, can I say I heard very clearly what you said. Um, submissions have closed, but yours is lodged in my mind. And um, the good news is that about 75 to 80 percent of Australian people think it's a good idea, so maybe it's got legs. But can I say I think I took from your comments, I think, in terms of this policy, uh, a number of things. The importance of partnership. Uh, the importance of funding, consistency and for longevity of relationships, uh, all of which I think are usually absent. Do we think we're being brave enough in, in this document? Um, are we seizing the opportunity? We want to, to, to be really clear about what we want to be as, as, a, as a nation. Um, and we want to be the best in the world. Which is why I think we need to, to be braver and seek to be uh, a centre of excellence and actually really fund the work around this, this policy in a way which actually delivers excellence rather than 80% excellence. And if we, can, if we can actually strive to be 110%, then we might be somewhere where we need to be in a few years' time. But I think we have to reach much further to get where we want to be in, in 2010, 2020, 2030, 2040. Thank you. Andrew. Um, you should all sit back and enjoy the engineer with the heart and soul who brought heart and soul into the comment. But I think they're also very sobering comments, those closing comments, given the budgetary situation which will be faced by whoever's in government and the, the, the desire to cut, to, to provide efficiency dividends and all the rest. But, I mean, powerful comments which give rise to some very difficult uh, issues. Uh, I think, uh, Marion, you with the next to have the call. Thank you. Um, I think I'm probably raising things that haven't quite been raised so far. One of them is the city-country divide, um, and it seems to me that arts have a really crucial role here. But the key, sort of key concepts that I picked up in the, the um, policy discussion paper, social cohesion, inclusion, critical thinking um, and resilience. So around the mental health stuff, the arts is really, really crucial for enabling people to talk about stuff that they would not otherwise talk about because they're not going to talk about it directly. The arts enable it to happen differently. Um, in terms of the rural communities that I work with who are land care farmers, there's some really urgent local issues that are national issues, and this is where the city, city country stuff happens. We've been able to use the web and digital storytelling to put together a community story. And it's a story that people know in isolation, and this is one way that they can tell each other. But what they're also doing is telling a really important national story as well. National Broadband Network, really, really crucial. One of the things that hit me, and again, this is where we have these silos and these different languages and we've always got problems. In the environmental sector, farmers working in natural resource management, we've had something like 17 changes of department for who has responsibility for doing things, as you probably know, in a whole lot of other sectors. So we lose stories all the time. You know, you fund projects and that's finished and it's gone and it's forgotten. Now, those, the outcomes of what we do is actually written on the landscape. And being able to tell digital stories, and it's only just hit me recently, is so crucial for an archive because it means that we can remember the story, you know, that sort of oral cult culture. And it's about speaking multiple languages, it's about not having silos, and it's about doing crossover. And, you know, if we can use the arts to talk about the carbon farming initiative and the green energy legislation and really key issues that people accidentally deal with because it's arts, we can actually deal with food security, an international problem. We need to talk about that. Organisations like local government play a key role in the implementation of those policies. 
Uh, local government is quite often now tasked with not just the roads, rates and rubbish, but the responsibility of the health and well-being of its communities. And as we all know, there's proven information to suggest that the health and being of communities can be strengthened and significantly improved by the investment in, uh, in the cultural aspect of community life. Um, and I think it's important for this policy to recognise that we are working in, in those small communities uh, through community and cultural development, which isn't, I know, which isn't mentioned too well in the paper, um, but that that can have profound impact. You know, in our work as community development workers, you would probably agree is, you know, our work is really to try and bring people into the front porch of their own houses and be proud and feel connected to where they live. And when they're proud and connected, um, they have a much more uh, investment and interest in, in the taking cultural pride in where they live. Quite often in local government they do have cultural planners, but they sit separate to other planning, uh, planning sections like development, uh, park, park and recreation facilities. But can you imagine how a park might look if it had the cultural interests uh, at, at hand too and put that into the, into the picture and perspectives? How uh, a street might look if it's not just from an engineering perspective, but also from a cultural perspective? So I guess also putting into place Same and point. into consideration the, quad, the notion of the quadruple bottom line. So not just social, economic and environmental, but cultural as well in, in terms of the, considering the social benefit. Um, and everyone in this room can probably share with you the profound impact that community cultural development has. And to not give it recognition and voice in this paper over creative industry and other sections is to forget the social, the health and well-being that's being discussed today around mental health and community happiness and community connections. Our interest as a business is in our, in our funding and so on is the education aspect of it. I think all things that we're doing here um, relate an understanding and appreciation and a, a willingness to, to be involved in arts and culture and so on goes back to very young people and I think the, the fact that people are formed so much of what you do and what you are in the future is in your early years. I think the educational side of, of an arts and cultural policy is really important. It's mentioned in here, I don't know that it's mentioned in enough depth. <coughs> um, we, I think at the, very, at the very high level government funding of arts and culture in schools has been only reducing over years, um, music classes, art classes and so on. It's been touched on a bit this morning but the main lesson to be drawn from working in Aboriginal health and community arts is the need to play the long game. We've, got to be, we've all got to be in for the long haul. Uh, and that's because community development is the heart of both activities in health and the arts. You can't mark a particular time when you draw a line in the sand and say that's finished or complete. Each step forward actually multiplies future possibilities and expands the work that needs to be done. There's another crucial aspect to the analogies between health and community arts, and that's the notion of doing harm. The harm very often has already been done. That means the injunction to do no further harm must be at the core of our work, and it must be one of our main ethical drivers. How often does the word ethical appear in the national cultural policy? Not at all. And it means there can be no short-termism in our work, no quick fixes, and we have to be flexible over time. In fact, short-term and one-off projects can be more damaging than not intervening at all. So that's why the apparent exclusion of community arts and cultural development practice is prevented in, you know, from this document is really, really disappointing. <coughs> It's the one arts practice that has an ethical base within the community. None of the arts practice, other arts practices do. It's the one arts practice by which we can measure and reflect real achieved social development rather than the one-sided notion that the arts is a mere dr driver of the economy or job creation or whatever. I I'm saying that community arts is at the heart of the idea of core cultural services because community <coughs> arts is about equity. And that's because community arts fulfills the many aspects of the proposed natural, national cultural policy as a concrete realisation of what are otherwise empty words and rhetoric around access and participation that you know, travel right through the document we're discussing. Um, my comments, I guess, are uh, from the perspective of philanthropic funding. And uh, look, I do think that the, the policy is a, is a very good start, but uh, what I'd like to address is what I see are a couple of gaps. Um, 
Firstly, what I think is missing is a desire to encourage collaboration and I mean not just artistic and cross-disciplinary and cross-cultural collaboration which Padma spoke eloquently about earlier and I, I think that CACD practitioners do that incredibly well but um, also from a funding and policy perspective um, there is a I think a tendency within the sector for, for uh, people and organisations to work in silos. Uh, I think this forum is such a fantastic initiative where we have a group of people coming together to discuss the, um, a policy. Um, I also think that we need to think more creatively about how we resource the cultural sector. Uh, and I don't just mean artistically, I mean um, uh, more particularly from an administrative perspective so that um, arts organisations have better access to funding. Um, all of you would know um, that you know, the search for, for money uh, and funding is incredibly time consuming, hit and miss, and wastes valuable resources that would be better allocated to your artistic pursuits. Um, and there's also a cycle of um, short-termism uh, that, that is, I think, a, of great concern. A lot of uh, private funding in particular goes towards project-based uh, project funding. And uh, whilst that's, uh, that's well and good, uh, a lot of uh, what is needed is capacity yeah. building for organisations. Yeah. Whilst I think that the NBN is a fantastic opportunity, um, my, my concern is that with opportunity often comes incredible pressure and I do worry that um, it, w where is the money going to come from? We actually need to ensure that uh, smaller organisations, poorly resourced organisations, can actually have access to that fantastic resource. I'm wary of confusing innovation with change. And I think that innovation should be something that springs from um, uh, valid and um, thriving artistic practice rather than being the absolute goal in itself because I think a lot of organisations, you know, particularly those in the room uh, here, are, are doing what they do incredibly well. They don't need to change what they're doing. Um, so I think that, that newness doesn't necessarily, uh, shouldn't necessarily be the end goal of, of what this policy is encouraging. It's a very rural uh, 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 area, um, a regional rural area, and, and so basically I think I can talk about the types of things that affect us with regard to culture. And there are several things that come out of that. The first very strongly, I believe, is this whole thing of uh, what Simon Crean uh, wrote this morning about the social dividend and the, uh, the economic dividend. Uh, from an educational perspective, I believe we're losing very strongly the social dividend. Um, it is turning into very strongly in schools, in terms of education <coughs> in our society, which reflects that, the whole thing of the economic dividend. Uh, I put that down very strongly to we have now an obsession that we must measure and test everything. The NAP plan has done more damage, I believe, to cultural diversity in this country than anything else in terms of what, in terms of what uh, uh, communities are really looking for from their educational institutions. It is very hard now to get uh, uh, art programs up at the VCE or the Year 12 level. Um, they, are, they are very under, undersubscribed by students because we've got this notion that the only thing that is worth doing in schools is a, uh, an academic test in literacy and numeracy. At the end of the day, I think we're not to lose sight of the fact that we're talking about people and individuals here. There are many reasons why we've been very actively involved over the last 11 years with the particular groups we are involved with. And that's very strongly about what it does for individual students in terms of exposing them to the arts, getting them to work and perform in the arts, and therefore to develop their culture. And we're talking about students who are very strongly underserved, underrepresented, street kids um, and the like. And for those who are involved with organisations that are catering for that particular group within our society, it's an incredibly powerful thing um, for us to be able to do and, and as I said I haven't talked about the word partnership very much but it only works because there is the partnership with the institution which is given the responsibility for if you like education within our society but it cannot do it alone and nor can the uh, arts groups do it alone without there being a very strong partnership uh, and that's where I would say that this needs to be addressed very very strongly and it's not at this stage. It takes time for people to understand the potential of the NBN. 
Uh, we have a nine and a half year rollout and we're a couple of years into that in some regards. But we need to be thinking about what that's going to mean in nine and a half years. And um, this sector needs to think about that too because it is going to take some time um, to get the building blocks right. And those building blocks are going to be around education. How do we ensure that Indigenous communities know how to use the technology, for example? Um, it's all well and good to have a fa fantastic, you know, fast broadband network, um, but really we need to, and I know people are thinking about this, I'm not trying to suggest that it hasn't been thought about, but I think in terms of responses to this very unique opportunity on cultural policy, we need to um, be thinking also about getting those building blocks right. Um, and having come from uh, the Senator Lundy um, forum last week, one of the key things across a number of cultural industries um, was also the need for more collaboration across the industries. It was interesting, um, they were all kind of carved up, and I think Pia spoke about the carve ups before. It include, included games developers, you know, to um, uh, screen producers, to musicians, etc. So I think it is about collaborating also across the sectors to tap into some of that. Because for digital natives, for my two-year-old, he's not going to just consume art in the way that we consume art. But it really is just encouraging you to think about the future and to contribute what you think at this point in time um, you need in terms of building blocks so that um, when the potential of the NBN is realised, you're right there at the forefront, both in terms of distributing what sound like you know, amazing um, examples of content and community inclusiveness, but also enabling people to access those and get above the noise in that discussion. I work in some of the most socially and economically disadvantaged communities and they are so disengaged that to get an education at this point is um, just not even on the radar. Mm -hmm. Art, culture, language gives them identity. Once they have that in place, and most, a lot of our communities have lost that, um, there is a program within my own community. My own community is um, extremely disadvantaged. I live in Barrable on the mid-north coast. And I would say that through a program of, um, well, not just a program, through a number of partnerships with um, community-based organisations, government, education, all sitting at the same table, trying to get on the same page and trying to work through this, that we are actually starting to engage some of the community. I think art has been um, probably at the forefront, art and sport, they both. Some like sports, some like art, <laughs> and that. But it has, it is starting to work. The advantage is that everyone at the table is in there for the long haul. The problem is that government don't fund for the long haul. Policy is short term. Um, look, we have a long way to go. I, I'm really philosophical, very passionate. I get up every. That's why I wake up every morning, is because I love what I do. But we have got a long way to go. Ladies and gentlemen, um, could I on your behalf thank the panel for what I think has been a really fascinating series of suggestions and comments. What I take away from the comments that have been made is that the draft policy in a sense touches on many good ideas. I mean virtually everything that people are concerned about is mentioned in some way in the policy. But I would read almost every comment as being a request that the policy be made far more robust in its dealing with the series of issues that have been raised by the panel. And I thought you know, your comments on the field of disability powerfully brought home the problems of that sector, but I think there was agreement at the table. Equally, there are the same structural issues relating to people who are disadvantaged, whether for ethnic origin, from geography, from whatever. There was something which wasn't uh, much discussed by the panel, which it seems to me is absolutely central. Uh, I think what you said was, um, who's going to lead it? And I think that's a really live question we might want to talk this afternoon. So I think you put a very important issue, what it is that will drive it, and what we've had are some demonstrations that it is 
It is backing people who do things that actually puts meat on the bones of good intentions. So I hope that in this afternoon's session we might get some more discussion of that. But uh, I think I can say on behalf of all of us who've been listening and on behalf of the department that you, the panellists, have really given us some, given them really, some great food for thought. <coughs> and uh, I think the contributions have been both powerful and moving and I they'll be part of uh, producing a more robust and muscular arts policy, which I think is the Minister's intention.